Hello? Okay. Are we starting this one over again? Uh, could somebody uh, uh, write me a little note to let me know that this this feed is actually working? There's Matt saying good morning again. Cynthia says okay. Matt and Cynthia, did you lose the last uh, the last feed? Okay, it looks like I'm back. Then I'm going to start over again. Welcome to the last installment of the last installment of Allow Me to Introduce. Uh, we had a little uh, false start there for a second, and I really appreciate Matt for uh, uh, informing me that we'd lost our feed before I, I read for the next 15 minutes uh, to no one listening. But anyway, I hope we're all back. And uh, I'll start over again. Believe me, I've read it before. The genre of classic horror has also changed the world. It can be argued that horror is the mother of science fiction and that science fiction has molded the future and touched the consciousness of countless millions of fans who now have given themselves permission to dream like gods. In its way, horror is the grandmother of theoret theoretical mathematics, quantum physics, and the mutation of intelligence in this corner of the galaxy. But it all had to start somewhere, and the editors of this anthology have labored lovingly to pay homage to the founding fathers of the art form. Some of them, like Edgar Allan Poe, or H.P. Lovecraft, or Bram Stoker, or Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, require little or no introduction. But others are perhaps less familiar to you. We've produced the briefest biographical sketches for all of our authors at the beginning of each of the sections. But I would like, you to, I would like to take this opportunity to write a few extra words about three of the stars of our production who also deserve, in my opinion, to be recognized as founding fathers of horror. Sir Edward Bulwar Lytton, who I believe should be credited with establishing early in the 19th century the archetypal form and devices of the horror genre. Robert W. Chambers, who late in the 19th century broke the space-time membrane of Gothic horror and smashed open the doors of our subconscious in the same, the same doors from which H.P. Lovecraft's primordial old ones would ooze out, forcing us to cower before our shadow soul. and Aleister Crowley, a real-life unapologetic black magician who early in the 20th century rolled up his sleeves and did battle with those shadows to turn demons of darkness into angels of light. So we'll start with Sir Edward Bulwar Lytton, 1803 to 1873. Have you ever heard the phrases it was a dark and stormy night. Or, the pen is mightier than the sword. Or, pursuit of the almighty dollar. These familiar cliches for, first poured forth from the pen of Sir Edward Bulwar Lytton, the prolific English playwright, poet, and novelist as it might be expected of a gentleman of his breeding, the noble Lord Lytton pursued these literary diversions as an amateur, while he busied himself with the serious duties of serving his Queen Victoria as Secretary of State for the Colonies, 
and his wide assortment of other stiff-collar diplomatic and political responsibilities. He published his first book of poems in 1820, and in 1828, when his semi-titillating essay on the whimsical subject of 19th century dandyism was released. It was clear to the reading public that here was a fellow who could be rarely entertaining as well as erudite. While his occult tales and horror stories have become favorites of lovers of the mysteries and the macabre, Lytton's most publicly beloved and familiar works remain his post-biblical epic, The Last Days of Pompeii, which over the years captured the imagination of filmmakers, and his dramatic history historical fiction, Rienzi, which Richard Wagner turned into an enduring opera. His popularity with the general public notwithstanding, Lord Lytton deserves serious recognition as one of the primary godfathers of horror. This enduring admiration attests to his skill with words, but even more impressive are his impeccable credentials among serious occultists. Although empirical, empirical evidence is absent, Lytton is said to have been an initiate of one or more of the mysterious continental magical secret societies that obliquely claimed they were of ancient Rosicrucian origins. He was almost certainly the friend and confidant of the great French magician Alphonse Louis Constant, or Eliphas Levy, the father of modern ceremonial magic. As a young member of the Rosicrucian order Amorc, I was instructed by my elder adepts, in no uncertain terms, that I was to read and study the works of Lord Lytton, especially the occult story Zanoni, written in 1842, a full generation before the founding of Madame Blavatsky's Theosophical Society or the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. The opening words of Zanoni can be interpreted as a Rosicrucian confession from Lord Lytton himself. It so chanced that some years ago in my younger days, whether of authorship of life, I felt the desire to make myself acquainted with the true origins and tenets of a, the singular sect known by the name of Rosicrucians. While the plot of Zanoni is, darkly, is a darkly appealing love story that inaugurates all the genteel devices of classic horror love that we will in a few years later recognize in the works of Edgar Allan Poe, Robert Chambers, and others. But the text of Zanoni also reveals to the trained eye the language of a fellow occultist. In fact, it is clear that Zanoni could not possibly have been written by anyone other than a bona fide initiate of the mysteries. The story even makes indirect reference to a magic book, a book which is undoubtedly the very, a very real tome known to scholars of today as the Book of Abramelin, or the Sacred Magic of Abramelin the Mage. This landmark occult grimoire, it's 1378, uh, would remain untranslated and unknown to the English-speaking world, or indeed to anyone else but the most knowledgeable and serious students of the occult, until 1888, when Golden Dawn adept S.L. McGregor Mathers translated fragments of the text, which he found in the Bibliothèque de Arsenal in Paris. The Book of Abermelon is considered by many to be the Rosetta Stone of Western magic, elevating the misunderstood superstitions of the medieval sorcerers to a spiritual science, as sacred and viable as 
the self-transformational traditions of Eastern mysticism. As it would seem, his lordship, uh, Sir Edward Bulwer-Lytton, dandy, diplomat, and novelist, was rubbing elbows on a regular basis with the same mystics and magicians who not only knew of the book's existence, but were intimately familiar with its contents and significance. It's clear to me that where occult mysteries and practices are concerned, it was not a case of Lord Lytton gleaning his occult knowledge from 19th century English Rosicrucian pretenders, but one of 19th century Rosicrucians getting their occult knowledge from him. While we heap praise on Lytton for being the founding father of horror, we must also credit him for helping introduce the world to the genre of science fiction. His 1871 novel, The Coming Race, would prove to be a breathtaking and disturbing look into the future. Unfortunately, early in the 20th century, the imaginative ideas put forth in The Coming Race would be uh, seized and distorted into a monstrous vision by the madman of Germany's Third Reich, and employed like some malevolent conjuration to invoke a great demon upon the earth in the form of a genocidal terror, terrors of the Second World War. No horror fiction story can possibly compare to such unimaginable evil. Such incalculable pain and death suffered by millions upon millions of our fellow human beings. Of course, I'm not suggesting that we should blame Lord Edward Bulwar Lytton for the genocidal horror of the Holocaust. However, we would all do well to be mindful of Lytton's own words. The pen is mightier than the sword. And be mindful of the awesome power the written word has to affect changes in human consciousness, either for good or for evil. Robert W. Chambers, 1827 to 1911. If H.P. Lovecraft is the Christ of horror, then most assuredly Robert W. Chamber was his John the Baptist. Recently it was my privilege to introduce and curate a series of short stories pu first published in 1895 under the collective title The King in Yellow by Robert W. Chambers. To avoid paraphrasing myself, I append a portion of my introduction below. While I refer specifically to The King in Yellow, my observations of Chambers' style, technique, and imagination also apply to our Chambers' selection, The Messenger. And I'd like to pause and point out that uh, The King in Yellow, uh, all of the different installments of The King in Yellow, uh, are available in a Wiser series that I also curated uh, called the, the King in Yellow. Uh, I believe they're only available at the moment in electronic form, but uh, I think you'd really enjoy it and probably even recognize certain uh, plot uh, forms and plot devices that we'd see in, in later things like the, the Twilight Zone and uh, the Night Gallery and things like that, Outer Limits. Perhaps you've heard of the King in Yellow. No, neither had I until a few years ago when a filmmaker contacted me and informed me he was making a film of the King in Yellow and asked if I would be interested in appearing in a cameo role in his production. Before I gave him my answer, and the project was later uh, abandoned, I'll never be in a movie. Uh, I did a bit of digging and discovered a most remarkable treasure, a terrifying work of an American horror 
of American horror that predates by a quarter century the first short story of H.P. Lovecraft. Indeed, The King in Yellow by Robert W. Chambers is arguably the archetypal inspiration for what would become an entire genre of horror fiction for which the immortal Lovecraft is ultimately credited. Robert W. Chambers uh, is not exactly a household name, but that has not, whoa, that has not always been uh, the case. Uh, late in his career, his romantic novels and historical fictions were wildly popular, his books bestsellers. His magazine installments eagerly awaited. For a time, he was considered the most successful American literary figure of the day. Yet his later and lighter often offerings, while bringing him fame and a modest fortune, are forgettable bonbons when compared to the strong meat and innovative brilliance of his horror fiction. The most notable of all of his work is The King in Yellow, a collection of short stories whose, whose plots are loosely connected to an infinite, infamous imaginary book and play of the same title, banned universally because of its ominous tendency to drive mad those who read it or came in contact with it. Indeed, the terror begins immediately with the reader unsure whether or not madness and suicide will be the price he or she will have to pay for turning the next page. I was a bit disoriented when I began reading The King in Yellow's opening story a dizzying effect that I'm sure Chambers intended to induce in the minds of his gay 90s readers. The tale called The Repairer of Reputations takes place in the science fiction future of 1920s New York City. A, metropolit a, a metropolis of street names, parks, and landmarks familiar to us all today which Chambers meticulously paints from his rich palette of images. He was, after all, a classically trained and skilled artist and designer. However, there is something disturbingly tweaked with the entire milieu of the story. It all takes place in a utopian and prosperous post-Civil War America a blend of aristocratic republic and military dictatorship that could have easily evolved from the strange bedfellows of the Gilded Ages contending movements of nationalistic laissez-faire capitalism and the liberal yet pragmatic ideals of social progressivism. From the opening lines, we are instantly plunged into an alternate reality where the comfortable and the familiar past has been slightly altered and we're forced to confront the infinite what-ifs of history and in doing so calling into question the objective reality of the present. Nestled within this surreal environment, we are introduced to a well-spoken narrator who at first seems to be a faithful servant of the truth, but who will soon give us reason to doubt both his sanity and our own. But I won't spoil that for you. Like Lovecraft would do decades later, Chambers allows the reader's own imagination to do the heavy lifting of terror. Casilda's song, which serves as an epigram for the entire work, is supposedly clipped from Act One, Scene Two of the play The King in Yellow. And without burdening the reader's imagination with concrete certitudes, conjures images of strange locales and vistas 
not of this earth, indeed not of this universe, and only hints of characters of unspeakable power and horror. Along the shore the cloud waves break, the twin suns sink beneath the lake, the shadows lengthen in Carcosa. Strange is the night where black stars rise, and strange moons circle through the skies, but stranger still is lost Carcosa. Songs that the Hyades sing, shall sing, where flap the tatters of the king, must die unheard in dim Carcosa. Song of my soul, my voice is dead. Die thou unsung as tears unshed shall dry and die in Las Carcosa. Like all great works of horror, the story becomes disturbingly dark, terrifying, in direct proportion to the degree to which our own hearts and minds are disturbed, dark, and frightened. Finally, Alistair Crowley, 1775 to 1947. Unlike Lord Lytton and Robert Chambers, Crowley is not remembered primarily for his works of fiction. Admittedly, he was a prolific poet, and in his capacity, even in his early 20s, he received a measure of critical praise and encouragement. Excuse me just for a moment. His two novels, Moonchild, 1917, and Diary of, the Dr of a Drug Fiend, 1922, also received a modicum of critical recognition and over the years have indirectly inspired a handful of film efforts. His short stories and essays, most privately published and now treasures coveted by collectors, were obviously written for an elite audience of highly educated esotericists and close associates capable of appreciating his elaborate in-jokes, pornographic allusions, and obscure references. As much as he lamented his rejection by the public, it appears he went to great lengths to openly court his own vilification. For the reader who is completely unfamiliar with the person of Aleister Crowley, I highly recommend his own Confessions and a recent biography, Peridou Rabo, The Life of Aleister Crowley by Richard Kaczynski. It has been my pleasure to, and challenge to write a handful of books concerning the life and work of this remarkable man. The following is a brief excerpt from my book, Understanding Aleister Crowley's Thoth Tarot. Paradoxes seem to define the life and career of Edward Alexander Crowley. Yes, in many ways he was a scoundrel. There is no doubt that he wallowed shamelessly in his carefully cultivated persona as England's literary and spiritual bad boy, at the same time, he took life and himself very seriously. Among other distinctions, he was a world-class mountaineer, chess master, painter, poet, sportsman, novelist, critic, theatrical producer. He introduced America to astrology, and there's a footnote here. Ghost writing for Evangeline Adams. Alistair Crowley wrote the bulk of the material first published under her name, including her classic texts, Astrology, Your Place in the Sun, and Astrology, Your Place Among the Stars. Now, if you're an astrologer, you know that those are the classic English language texts of astrology. 
These words, these works made astrology a household wor word in America and Europe and catapulted Adams to celebrity status as astrologer to Wall Street and Washington. Recently, Crowley's co-authorship has been graciously acknowledged by the Adams estate and has resulted in the release of the general principles of astrology by Alistair Crowley and Evangeline Adams. So, Crowley introduced America to astrology, Isadora Duncan to the Yi Ching, Aldous Huxley to Mescaline, yes, and the poet Victor Newberg to hiking and high magic. As an agent pro provocateur writing for an English language German propaganda newspaper, he penned the outrageous and inflammatory editorials that provoked a reluctant United States Congress to enter the First World War on England's side. During the Second World War, at the request a friend and naval intelligence officer, Ian Fleming, yes, James Bond, Crowley provided Winston Churchill with, a vi with viable insights into the superstitions and magical mindset of the leaders of the Third Reich. He also suggested to the Prime Minister, if reports can be believed, that he exploit the enemy's magical paranoia by being photographed as much as possible giving the two-fingered V for victory gesture. This sign is the manual version of the magical sign of Apophis and Typhon, a powerful symbol of destruction and annihilation that according to the magical tradition is capable of defeating the solar energies represented by the swastika. Astonishingly, Crowley's adventures and achievements, more than any dozen men of ambition and genius could realistic ho realistically hope to garner in a lifetime, seem almost to be distractions when weighed against his monumental exploits of self-discovery. His visionary writings and his efforts to synthesize and integrate esoteric spiritual systems of the East and West. They make him one of the most fascinating and cultural, cultural and religious figures of the 20th century. Now, even though Crowley did not, like Edward Bulwer-Lytton, invent the genre that would define the format and atmosphere of classic horror, even though he wasn't responsible for transforming horror into the morbid sweet love song of, tormented, of a tormented soul like Edgar Allan Poe, even though he didn't smash the dimensional boundaries of space-time to plumb new depths of psychological hell like Robert Chambers and H.P. Lovecraft, he did something none of them did. He actually lived the terrifying and ecstatic events of the real-life horror love story adventure of his own amazing life. He didn't just write about demons and devils and angels, vampires. He invoked them, evoked them, conjured them, battled them, conquered them. He didn't just write about the wonders and terrors of other dimensions. He willfully penetrated them, navigated them, transcended them. Then he wrote about them in exacting detail. Nearly 70 years after his death, the man who the tabloids called the most dangerous man on earth, the man they called the wickedest man in the world, the man who in all seriousness called himself the Beast 666, is now receiving the academic and philosophical attention and recognition that eluded him in life. Crowley's influence today on the literary art form of horror is incalculable. There isn't a modern writer of horror, science fiction, or fantasy who has not in some fundamental way been directly or indirectly influenced by Crowley. 
Crowley is dead. But his horror reaches, reaches from beyond the grave. Robert Chambers wrote of an accursed book in a play called The King in Yellow. Supposedly, everyone who read The King in Yellow went hideously insane. I think of that and smile when I encounter people today who still fearfully hold the person of Aleister Crowley in superstitious awe. Is it dangerous to study Aleister Crowley? I'm often asked. Aleister Crowley was by no means perfect. He was not good with people. He often alienated those who loved him dearly, dearest. His bold exploration of human sexuality and drugs, always meticulously recorded and analyzed, are fascinating to study, but were never intended to be casually emulated. I've never encountered anyone who knew him that did not disapprove of some aspect of his character or behavior. But he's dead. For us, only his works remain as a measure of the man, and they are currently more accessible to the public than at any time during his life. His influence on the modern world of art, literature, religion, and philosophy is now widely acknowledged even by his most vehement critics. But is it dangerous for some people to study Aleister Crowley? I guess I would have to say yes. For those whose belief in a God of goodness hinges upon the reality of a devil who is equally evil, for the superstitious, the ignorant, the lazy, the immature, the unbalanced, the paranoid, the faint-hearted, for anyone who for any reason cannot or will not take responsibility for their own actions, their own lives, their own souls. For these people, Aleister Crowley is still a dangerous man. And now, dear reader, I will leave you to enjoy the works of these three masters of horror and the choir of other luminaries uh, of the genre. I hope you'll enjoy your time with them uh, and will treasure this beautifully produced book. Perhaps when you have finished reading it, you'll want to put it in your family library, near the dictionary and the encyclopedia. Who knows, perhaps someday some bored young man or woman will discover it on a hot summer morning. For the time being, I bid you good night. And I thank every one of you for sitting through these uh, readings of Allow Me to Introduce. And... Uh, I want you to know that tomorrow I will start reading one of the most fun books uh, for me to write, uh, and that's Ask Baba Lon. And many of you uh, have said that's the one you want me to read next, and it's certainly the one Constance wants me to read next. So uh, that's what we'll do starting tomorrow. So until then, continue to be good to yourself and be good to each other. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will.